God designed us to be learners. However, much of our learning and discipleship today regarding the church, current affairs, and theology has been reduced to pithy sayings and viral tweets. Just Say It seeks to help Christians go deeper on church, theology, scripture, and current issues in our world. I'm Chase Davis. And I'm Matt Patrick. And join us and other guests for a monthly conversation on the topics that are impacting Christians in the church here in Colorado. You can expect candid conversations on the topics ranging from church attendance during ski season to Spurgeon's view of the atonement. Welcome back to another episode of Just Say It. We are glad to be with you here today. Uh, This is a podcast intended for our church to bless our church, and we actually got someone to uh, share her time with us on the podcast who I'm really excited about. We have Heidi Ganahl, and Heidi has had a lot of positions. She used to be a resident of Boulder County, uh, regent at CU, all these kind of things. So Heidi, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on and uh, blessing our church with your time. Well, thank you for having me. I'm honored. And it's a topic I'm very passionate about now is how faith and politics intertwine. It's a feisty one, but I'm not afraid to go there anymore. I'm not a candidate anymore, so I can speak pretty freely. Yeah. And and as our listeners know, uh, we're generally not afraid to go there either. And our goal is just to be helpful and have a little fun while we do it. Um, Hey, Heidi, uh, just kind of start us off. You know, I I know who you are. I'm assuming a lot of people do, um, but it'd be good for our guests to know a little bit more about you. How did you become a Christian and what have you been up to the last few years? (laughs) Well, I've had kind of a crazy life and my journey, my faith journey has been interesting up and down and all around, but my faith's never been stronger. And actually the governor's race um, is what, I don't know, take it to another level. But uh, I started out as an entrepreneur. I built Camp Bow Wow, the country's largest pet care franchise. It was actually a dream that I had with my first husband. We both loved dogs. We were very entrepreneurial. And sadly, he crashed or he died in a plane crash at the age of 25. Mm. Um, and I was 27. My life got turned upside down. I really, that's where my faith journey really got deep. I was like, what on earth do I believe? Like, how could this happen? Um, mm. You know, I was I just very happy. I'd never really had anything bad happen to me. And it turned my life upside down. Um, as I grew Camp Bow Wow, I really enjoyed helping other people live their American dream and just the idea that we could all do something we love and make a good living off of it was incredible. And I sold Camp Bow Wow in late 2014 to VCA, the big veterinary clinic, because I had gotten remarried, found love again, um, and had three kids under the age of three and a teenager from my previous marriage. So it was a crazy time and I decided to focus on my family and, and um, hand the business off. At that time, I also wanted to give back though. So somebody said, you know, you love the CU buffs. You're you're a huge buff and you um, love education reform. You've been very active in that space and you love politics. So why don't you run for regent at the University of Colorado? And I thought, what on earth does a regent do? And found (laughs) out that it's like the board of directors for the university system. We're one of four states that elects our board of regents. So you have to run for political office. And so I jumped in and I ran in 2016 and pulled off uh, an upset against Alice Madden, one of the most formidable for uh, Democrats in politics in Colorado. And I ended up being the only statewide Republican after a few years when Cory Gardner lost his Senate race. And folks were like, well, what do you want to do? You've got to do something since you're the last standing Republican in Colorado statewide. So I said, well, I don't want to go to D.C. My kids are too young, so I think I'll take a shot at governor. And they were like, what? There's no way you can beat Jared Polis. He's got way too much money and power. And I'm very optimistic. I take challenges head on. And so I was like, oh, I think we'll be fine underestimating um you know the 35 million dollars he would drop on my head and and the uh, (laughs) lack of organization our party has so yeah i jumped in the governor's race after i was going to jump in in 2020 in the fall and ended up getting getting diagnosed with a brain tumor um out of the blue and it wasn't cancerous but it was pretty serious and i had to have brain surgery so my plans got put on hold for a few months while i had the surgery and recovered and afterwards my friends and family were like well obviously you're not going to run for governor now and i was like you know when they took out that tumor they took out my filter i'm feistier than ever i'm going to go for it (laughs) so the last couple years i spent running for governor and and really getting to know colorado and and one of my passions was visiting churches all over the state so i visited over 100 churches on the campaign and got to speak at a lot of them and learn to preach (laughs) 
<laughs> That's funny. That's great. So when you got into educational reform, what sparked your interest in educational reform? Well, I got asked to be on the board of a new school called Golden View Classical Academy, which was a Barney Charter School out of Hillsdale. And one of the first, it was the first in Colorado. And my friend asked me to be on the board. I'm like, I know nothing about starting schools. And he goes, but you know how to start businesses. So that's good. And it was just such a joy. And I saw the kids that came to our school really enjoy learning. And I thought, I didn't enjoy learning and my older daughter didn't enjoy learning and my little kids are just starting their journey and they don't. This is amazing. Like, how do we open more of these schools? So I helped them open several other charter schools. We tried to open one in Boulder oh, uh, after my kids came home one day from school a few years ago. My twins were in first grade. Holly was in third grade and told me about a play they'd seen where um, a little baby bird had gotten a sex change. I'm like, oh, what? What are you talking about? These are my first graders telling me about this. And um, they actually, they told me about the play that was coming. And then I found out about it later and um, was just kind of horrified. Like, why are they teaching our kids this stuff, especially our babies like that are so little? And so uh, myself and a bunch of other families got engaged and involved and, and ticked off and tried to push back and got called all kinds of names and, you know, told we were terrible people for rejecting this narrative and this was kind of before everything happened in the school systems with all the woke stuff but come to find out this program at CU Boulder in the Department of Education had trained over 5,000 teachers in North Denver on how to queer the curriculum so we tried to start a charter school at one of the ascent schools up there we had 700 kids signed up we did a great job getting families you know on board and then the board of the school board turned it down and we appealed it to the state they turned it down. They first they sent it back and then it got turned down. Jared Polis was nowhere to be seen, even though he lives right there. And so I was very, very sad. And we decided to move our, our family down to Douglas County so they could get the education we wanted for them. And now they're in a small private Christian school that I helped. Uh, at our, I was one of many families that started it up down here. Yeah, that's a big tension that we feel. Uh, both Chase and I have small children and uh, Chase's kids go to, up to Rocky Mountain and uh, like my daughter's over at Sacred Heart and just trying to find a, a uh, you know, a school for for them is, has been a challenging thing here in, in Boulder. And it'd be beautiful if something could be started right here in the heart of Boulder. But we'll, we'll see what God's up to there in the future. Yeah, I don't uh, think that's going to happen anytime soon as far as a charter school, a new charter school yeah. or public school. But um, I do think there's some great things happening in the homeschool movement, micro schools, private schools. You know, parents are really fired up about what's happening. And it's not that we have any less love for the children who have, you know, um, different perspectives or families that have different perspectives. It's just that we want to control those narratives as parents and make sure that our kids are ready to have those conversations and that we get to have those conversations with them, not school staff or administrators or, you know, teachers. That's a lot of pressure to put on a teacher too. So I just really believe that the parents should drive education and those um, very delicate conversations. And it doesn't mean we can't be loving and inclusive and, um, you know, make make the world less of a um, intense place um at school because these kids just need to learn to read and write and do math and leave the other stuff to the parents yeah uh, that, that, that's good uh kind of shifting gears a little bit you know i, I actually uh reached out to you initially just i, I listened to a podcast you're on and you were just kind of expressing um a little bit of frustration you may have had when you were on the campaign trail for the governorship with a lot of churches who uh, would, you know, kind of whisper to you that, hey, we really support you, but we can't ever say anything uh, yeah. about supporting you. And so that kind of leads me into a question. It, it's something that we've had to navigate in our own church quite a bit, which is, you know, a lot of people say, you know, the church shouldn't be political uh, and Christians shouldn't really dive into that realm. It's just too messy or wh whatever the reason might be. There's, there's countless reasons. But I'm just curious, uh, after I heard you say that on there, I, I, I wanted to get your perspective on what you think churches shouldn't maybe shouldn't be doing in regards to politics. Well, I think that getting involved doesn't mean you have to get up and say, vote Republican or vote Democrat or vote for this candidate or that candidate. But 
by golly, the church needs to engage and Christians need to vote and vote their values. Right now, a third of Christians across our country don't vote. They just don't vote. And so how are we supposed to drive culture and make sure that, um, you know, that our decision making around who we're voting for and who we're supporting and who we're engaged with doesn't align with our faith and our values if we're not involved. And so I encourage pastors to, um, you know, not cross the line of telling people how to vote necessarily, but just to talk to people about their importance of them being engaged and voting and really being a part of the process and running for office too, whether it's your local school board, city council, commissioner, getting on boards and commissions. There are some very, very serious conversations happening that are driving our lives and our kids' lives that we need to be a part of. And I love the book. I don't love it because of the content is very difficult, but I love the way he portrays it, um, Eric Metaxas, in Letter to the American Church. And he compares what's happening today to Nazi Germany and how many churches just stayed neutral or stayed out of it. I mean, thousands and thousands of pastors wouldn't get involved. And what if they had gotten involved? We might have a very different story. I mean, look at what's happening across the world right now. It is time for us to stand up for our faith, to speak loudly and to, um, you know, live out our faith through politics and being involved in the culture. Yeah, I've got a question on that with regard to getting involved in politics as a Christian. You know, I think one of the fears some Christians might have would be, um, one, they're very cynical on the whole system. You know, a lot of people our age are very, like, cynical on any possibility of change. But another would be, like, politicians have to compromise all the time when they get into politics. And so what was your experience like with that kind of, you know, getting in politics? And you have to negotiate, you have to do that kind of thing. But did you feel like you had to compromise your values when you were running for governor? No. And that got me into trouble. Sometimes people were like, why can't you say this? It's just going to be so much easier to win if you'll just concede a little bit on this one issue. And I thought, you know, I'd rather be right with God than right with politics and um, the election. And if I lose by standing in my faith or standing on my principles, then so be it. But I do worry about um, how people make decisions on who to vote for. Um, they see an ad in the last couple of weeks of the election that some politician, maybe it was Jared Polis, spending tens of million dollars advertising against me and for himself and representing something that's very different than the reality of what that that um, person you know is going to make as far as a policy choice. So I encourage people to really do their research, get to know both sides of an issue, listen to both both politicians on both sides, both parties, all parties, so that you get an understanding of who's saying what, what's the truth, um, how to navigate the media. The media is so biased right now. So you've got to find other ways to get to the truth, whether it's through people you trust or on Twitter or in your neighborhood or your church, your pastor. I think cultural impact teams are really important in churches right now. It's a way to give people um, good information, good, honest information that they can rely on and that the church kind of not puts their rubber stamp on, but says, yes, this is this is appropriate. This is valid. This is from sources that we know are good. And uh, the Truth and Liberty Coalition has done a good job of creating um, lots of tools and resources to help churches do this and create cultural impact teams. I think that's probably the most important thing a church can do right now. It's interesting you bring up, you know, like ads that come out. A friend of Chase and I's just uh, in a special election last night won a uh, state Senate seat, Dusty Devers in Oklahoma. Uh, and he, he's a pastor. And just oh. watching what he had to go through and just the smear campaigns and all the things that were thrown at him was appalling. And especially, I mean, I, we loosely know him. Um, we're friends. But uh, just watching that, it, it must have been a lot for you to have to navigate here in the state of Colorado. I'm thinking if it was hard for him in Oklahoma, uh, being somebody who has um, spent a lot of time in Boulder, and but just being in our state, I'm sure that that was difficult. Yeah, it's pretty vicious. Um, in the beginning, it hurts. It's hard. People are like, is that true? Did you? Are, is that how you feel? Is that who you are? It's like, no, that's not true. They're just making it up. They lie a lot. <laughs> and, you know, both sides does this in some capacity. But, you know, I got slaughtered in, from the media and from Jared Polis' money, his ads he did, which were just blatant lies about me and my policy stances. 
And unless you have the money to fight back and to put ads up to say the alternative, you're not going to get help from the media to say the alternative if you're a conservative, um, especially you know, a conservative Christian. So you've got to rely on having money to push back and get your message back out there. And fundraising is really tough in Colorado. Um, donors understand that it's a really big lift to win here, especially statewide. So it's kind of a perfect storm right now, but I don't want to discourage people. If you look at the numbers, there are 4.4 million registered voters in Colorado and only 2.5 million voted in the governor's race last year. That's almost 2 million people who sat at home and didn't turn their ballots in. And so Mm -hmm. if we can reach more people and encourage them to vote and get engaged through our churches, then we can easily shift an election. I needed 400,000 more votes to win the election. And so if you look at all the churches across Colorado, you know, I think if they really look at what they're voting for, whether it's abortion until birth or, you know, taking power away from parents, teaching these things in our schools that go against our values, I think they would really make different decisions. But people just aren't taking the care and the time and the energy to do the research and to get engaged and to pay attention to the importance that that vote has. Uh, speaking of the media real quick, you know, back in I can't remember when it was. Uh, but I, I used to watch nine news. I was like an old man in my early thirties and I would watch the nightly news. <laughs> and I remember them doing a story one night. And this was when I decided I'm never watching them again. They were promoting transgenderism and how great it was, how like awesome it was that this girl's coming out as a boy, all this kind of stuff. And I was like, I think I'm done. And, you know, I'd tune back in every once in a while and be like, I wonder what they're saying about other stuff, you know, politics or COVID or whatever. Um, but since then I haven't found or been able to discern media sources in Colorado. I think you mentioned, uh, one group that's trying to do stuff, but what's like if an average Christian in the church is looking for trustworthy news sources in the state of Colorado, where would you point them to? You know, there are some good conservative media outlets. Um, there's, um, complete Colorado, there's campfire Colorado, there's the independence Institute, um, and the Gazette, of course. Um, Sean Boyd on CBS is good. So we do have some bright lights, but unfortunately they get drowned out because it's they're so outnumbered. So one of the projects I'm working on is to build a conservative media platform, an aggregator of news so that um, conservatives in Colorado can go to one place and find all these sources and all these outlets. I have a podcast now called Unleashed, which I do once a week, and I'm trying to get the truth out about what I learned behind the scenes, what I know, that other people don't know about politics and government and bureaucracy, but we need a hundred of me doing this, you know? Mm. Um, And so we're going to try and change that and turn the momentum so that people can have the truth and know what the narrative is on the left. And in hopefully, you know, we're going to give a balanced view. That's good. Uh, So I'm curious, you you said that you got to go and visit over a hundred churches, which is sounds exhausting. Um, I, I have to visit one every Sunday and I love it, but it's also tiring. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, what, what was kind of the takeaways when you were running? For the, what, were there any big takeaways that you had of interacting with um, all these different Christians from all over the state? What, what was kind of the feel that you were getting when you were on the campaign trail? Well, one of my favorite things was actually Sundays and getting to visit, like, what church am I going to this Sunday? And will I get to speak or am I just going to, you know, enjoy the experience and and meet folks and and get to know them? Um, But it was such a wide variety and different cultures, different um, uh, denominations. And what I did notice was the people are yearning. They're yearning for the truth and they're yearning for a guiding light, like they're they're looking for leaders of in the faith community to say enough is enough. Like this is the way. This is how we're supposed to move forward, and to really just take the bull by the horn and lead. They want political leaders to do that. They want um, their church leaders to do that. And there's this sentiment that I know something's wrong. I know things are not right right now, but I'm overwhelmed with just day to day with the economy being so bad, with inflation so bad, with crime so bad. Like, how do I worry about fixing the state when I can't even keep afloat in my Hmm. own life? And so giving people hope and encouragement was really important and not just, you know, raining down bad news, but also giving them very tactical ways to help. Like one is just vote. That's the first thing you can do is just vote and vote your values. (laughs) Number two, 
get your neighbors to vote. Like talk to your neighbors about politics. Don't make it this scary taboo topic. Find something that you guys can agree on and talk about it. Have a coffee at your house. Just start local in your community and support your local candidates. And the third thing is, get a cultural impact team going in your church and have a voter registration table. Like I said, it doesn't have to say Republican or Democrat. It just says vote. And we're going to take a stance as the church that you do have to get involved. We do have to be involved. So those three things are really, really important. But most of all, I think people need to do a little bit of research, find good sources that they trust and, um, you know, really make an educated vote and get 10 to 20 people around them to do the same. And we will change elections. 64% of people in Colorado consider them Christians. And if you think we had 2.5 million voters in the governor's election, if 64% voted their values, it would have turned out very, very differently. So that's Mm -hmm. the key to turning Colorado around. Yeah. Matt, you have another one you wanted to ask? Yeah, yeah, I kind of stemming off of that. Uh, I, I'm curious too, um, just because we, we don't mind being a little edgy. I, I'm curious as you were trying to, you know, go visit churches. It sounds like that that was part of a plan that you had as a as a Christian yourself. Uh, did you receive any pushback from churches that were like, <laughs> yeah. no, we're, we're not really interested? In the, and 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 to be fair, I, I understand that, right? You know, you feel like you're walking a tightrope a bit. But um, I'm just curious what what that looked like for you. Oh, yes, probably only a quarter of the churches that we reached out to agreed to have me come and maybe a half of those let me speak. So it was is very rare that I got to speak and get up and actually address the congregation. But I didn't mind. I liked going and just mingling and and getting to know the pastor and talking to them and the the leadership team. Um, But what what was really interesting to me was my own pastor of a very, very large church in North Denver wouldn't like he kept saying, I'm going to meet with you. Yeah, I'll talk to you. And I was like, I don't want an endorsement. I don't expect you to put me on stage. I just want to talk to you and get your take and get your involved, like what's your level of involvement and um, wouldn't like, wouldn't do it and just kept avoiding meeting with me. And then a few weeks ago, he got up and spoke about, you know, Satan being right in front of us and the devil being right in front of us. And that there were these horrible paintings in the, um, in the governor's office that were Satanistic. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Why didn't you talk about that when we were, you know, campaigning? It could have been a totally different story. And so, um, you know, but I give him, I give him props for finally speaking up. So that's good, but we have so much farther to go. So I would suggest people start by reading, especially pastors, give this book to your pastor, the letter to the American church. I think it'll give them some courage and some faith that it's okay to speak up and talk about politics. And it's such an important time right now with, I mean, evil is just, taking a grip on our society and we've got to push back Hmm, that's good i I have another question but chase you go ahead no yeah i was just gonna ask like in colorado i mean for from my vantage point it's really hard because it's such a transient state there's a lot of people moving in moving out um a lot of the transients especially in a place like boulder with the college you get a lot of californians coming in um Mm -hmm. and so it just feels somewhat hopeless, but I, I feel that I sense that you're trying to paint a more hopeful picture. Mm-hmm. I guess my question in relation to that would be when you visited places around the state, did you sense kind of a, a hunger for, for something other than uh, polis or, or socialism in our state or, or Marxism in the government? Did you sense a lot of people like clued into that or are people kind of laissez faire and libertarian here to where they don't care? <laughs> Well, I think, ah, geez, this is a tough one. (laughs) The people that are awake are loud and they talk about it and they support, you know, this pushback, but there's just not enough of them. Like there, it's rural Colorado, it's some of the redder counties, but the more folks that move into the state, the more that young people are indoctrinated in the schools and with social media, you know, the less they're willing to listen to these alternative views. And they're not really alternative views. They're what our country was founded on, right? It's who we are as America. I do think like what's happening in Israel right now and the anti-Semitism that the Democrat party is showing it so boldly in some cases is really turning some people off and making them realize that, um, wow, maybe my party isn't what I thought it was. And this is really important. And I don't want to see 
babies and ch like children being murdered and, and this happening in order to, you know, um, fight a battle. So we've got to fight our own battle. And that's getting our word out, getting our message out, getting people reconnected to who America is and that we were founded on faith. We were founded on these principles. And that's how we're going to hold on to our country is by getting back to that, um, by letting it slip every little inch that we give to socialism, to Marxism, to electing the wrong people. It's a it's one step closer to losing the freedom that we have. And I think people are starting to wake up to what it might look like if we lose our freedoms by just watching the news and what's happening across the world. That's good. Uh, what, what like stemming off of that and coming kind of coming home to Colorado here, uh, as we try to be a little bit specific, are there any issues or things that, that you would encourage uh, that, that we're, we will be voting on or are being discussed right now that maybe you have insight into that maybe a lot of just normal people like I've, I've when I'm off this, I have to take one kid to baseball, one kid to soccer. And, you know, it's hard to keep up with everything. But are there any issues that you that are on the top of your mind that you'd say Christians really need to be paying attention to these issues that they're going to be voting on in coming elections? Yeah, the biggest one is Prop HH, which will get rid of our Tabor refunds. They'll give us a little tickler uh, one time and then we lose control of Tabor forever. And they say that it's gonna lower property taxes. That's a bunch of bunk. Like it's a, it's just a total hoodwink. And a lot of people are starting to realize that probably not enough though. They have so much money in the other party that they're gonna you know, just barrage us with ads that make it sound great. So no on Prop HH, it's a really important vote to keep the size of government from growing and to keep more money, our money back into our pockets. Um, all Tabor does is it, it requires the government, the bureaucrats, the elected leaders to come back to the people of Colorado and ask for permission to raise our taxes. And the people of Colorado can decide on each individual basis if they want their taxes raised. Right now we are being annihilated with taxes and fees and the growth of government regulation. The, gr the size of government in Colorado has grown by a a fourth, 25% in the last term. So as since Jared Polis became governor in the last decade, our budget, our state budget has doubled. How better off are we? We are not better off than we used to be. And so we've got to get back to lean, effective government, reducing the size of government, putting it back in its proper place, lowering taxes, lowering regulations, getting out of people's lives. That's the Colorado I grew up with. That's the libertarian, like free thinking, rugged individualism that Colorado should get back to. That's one good. last question I've got, and I don't know if Matt has another one, um, but I think, you know, for a lot of Christians that I, that we minister to that, that we're talking with, the idea is, is really like prevalent that neither party's that good. Um, both are corrupt. And you do see this, you see corruption in both parties. And I'm just curious, you know, that that's a big turnoff to a lot of people. They're very yeah. like, they want candidates that are either pure or perfect, or they want to align with a party that isn't, uh, you know, uh, that is more perfect than, than maybe what's realistic. How much you help someone understand, you know, you're, you're a Republican candidate, it's probably even in our own church, people are gonna be like, you had a Republican on, you know, what are we doing? And so there's a slogan people will say like truth over tribe or all these pithy things, Jesus was neither left nor right, that really demurs people from getting involved. How would you respond to those kind of things? Well, I think you look at the policy issues and decide which side you should be on if you have a strong faith or you're a Christian. You know, aborting a baby until birth, I don't think that's very Christian-like. And, um, you know, giving our children the idea that they can change, that they were born in the wrong body and that they can mutilate their bodies uh, to change it. You know, I have a lot of compassion for kids that have confusion over their gender identity, but it's become a social contagion. It's not okay anymore. And, you know, that's just two examples. The list goes on and on and on. And we're not helping people right now. We're not helping people out of poverty. We're not helping people who are addicted to drugs. We're not helping people who are homeless with these policies. So let's just try something different. Try bringing a little bit of balance back to the state. The difference between the parties, it's not good or evil or you know bad versus good. It's just different ideas on how to solve the problems that we face as a society. I have very different solutions than Jared Polis does about how to fix the problems we're facing. It, it can be that simple. And so when people are really saying like, I'm not crossing the line and voting for a Republican, why? 
why won't you try it? Like, what's the harm in trying? Um, and if you get to know the person and the candidate, and just because you may disagree on one or two issues, how about the 10 issues you do agree on? How about the attraction to someone who does respect their faith and their relationship with Jesus Christ and want to honor that? Um, I would just ask those questions and just know that I believe everybody has the best intentions for the most part, no matter what party they're in. We just have different ideas on how to solve the problem. And unfortunately, we are in a society where, or in a, a government structure where we, the two parties are what get elected. You can register as an unaffiliated, you can be a libertarian, I'm very libertarian-ish, but you won't win the election. It's just, that's the hard, cold truth. So you've got to pick a side. Hmm. That's good. And, and just for all of our listeners, you know, if we anybody wants to come to us from our church and say you had a Republican on, um, I mean, open invitation to pull us if he ever wants to hop on our show. Uh, yes. ha happy to have him. We, we, we <laughs> have some great questions and have, I'm sure we'd have a great time. I actually see him somewhat regularly. He played on one of my kids. His kid plays on one of my kids baseball teams. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask you if I can get through the security. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> but we'll go from there. Um, Heidi, one last thing just to wrap up our time i mean you mentioned your podcast you have going on if uh i think it'd be cool for people to know what, what are you up to these days now that you you said you're not running for any office right now but what, what are you up to and how can people learn more about what you have going on well after pouring my heart and soul into that race for a couple of years it was a gut punch you know after the election was over and i was really sad for colorado and and what was going to happen uh, because of the direction it's headed and so I just did some real soul searching, a lot of prayer, uh, a lot of just reconnecting with my family and friends and figuring out what I wanted to do next. And I feel called to do a couple things. One is to help um, families get their kids out of the public school system if they're not getting the education they deserve. So I'm helping a really amazing nonprofit do just that and grow around the country to do more of that. And I'm helping with the education savings account movement that's happening, passing laws around the country to give families access to the dollars so that they can do different things. That's not going to happen in Colorado anytime soon, even though Jared says he's school choice friendly, he's not. So um, we've got to do it in different ways through private scholarships and um, through working in the states that will do do that. And then the last thing is, I learned so much in the governor's race about how politics works, how the bureaucracy works, how government works. And I want to share what I learned so that it doesn't just go away with my campaign. And um, so that's why I decided to do the podcast. I do it once a week. It's about an hour. You can watch it, listen to it or read it on Substack. And it's really about telling the truth about politics in Colorado and, and what's really going on, like taking the curtain back and looking at how the sausage is made. So it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy doing it. I try and put a lot of thought and care into the episodes. I call myself a quasi investigative journalist now, which is scary. But um, <laughs> It's kind of, it's my pay it forward from all the support and love I got on the campaign. I wanted to continue to be involved and help our party heal, help our state heal and figure out how people can get involved and really make a difference. Well, that's great. Thanks for uh, taking time to talk with us, Heidi. Appreciate you coming on. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure. And I'm always willing to come back if you have any questions or any issues that you want me to do a deep dive on. I just encourage all of your listeners, just take baby steps into politics. Just learn a little bit more about your candidates in this next election. We've got an election in a few weeks. Um, very important school board elections, city council, county commissioners. Really do a deep dive. Just try this one election doing that. See what you can find. And don't just go to Ballotpedia or Wikipedia. Do some real investigation and talk to people who know the ones running and, and get to know them. And then share your thoughts with your friends and family who aren't willing to do the research or don't have the time. That's great. Well, thanks so much for coming on. If you are a listener, thank you for joining us today. I hope this conversation was helpful and informative for you. And if you're a member of our church, you go to our church. We'd love to talk with you about anything on here uh, that you heard brought up. As we always are, we're available on Sundays in Boulder at 930 a.m. So we'll uh, see you Sunday and we'll see you next time here on Just Saying.